Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett along with Kent Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues and today we welcome in the Insurance Commissioner. Yes, uh, Glenn Mulready has uh, graciously agreed to uh, be with us today and talk about what's going on in his office. It, there's a lot and I think uh, our viewers will find this very interesting. Absolutely. Glenn Mulready, today's guest on The Verdict. And we'll be right back. I'm a raw food culinary chef, and my co-founder and I became super passionate about just nourishment and simple, fresh, healthy ingredients. My name's Haley Nutt. I am the founder of Tribal Cold Press Juice, and I am Chickasaw. We started pressing our juices, just the raw organic produce. We hand bottle, hand fill, hand label. The name Tribal came from my Chickasaw roots. It really is focused around the idea of community. I definitely feel honored and humbled to be a modern day Chickasaw in this community and really taking my roots and my heritage and using it as honestly fuel and motivation because I want to carry it on. I want to carry on the legacy of building things up, of having resilience. Tribal is growing and expanding and we want to continue to grow it and if doors open, we will walk through them. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at profilesofanation.com. When I came to work for the ODVA, I started realizing the opportunity to take care of veterans. It's a powerful thing when you realize that you are taking care of people that made history. Working here is a calling. It's really, really important that they don't just come here to exist. We want to give them meaning to their lives. We try to make life happy and meaningful and fulfilled for our veterans. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. As we indicated in the open, our guest today is Glenn Mulready, the uh, Insurance Commissioner of the State of Oklahoma. He is, in fact, the 13th person to hold that office in state history. He began in the insurance business in uh, 1984, and he's uh, been in it now for 35-plus years. Uh, he uh, was engaged in the private insurance business for a number of years. In addition, he had uh, eight years in the Oklahoma House of Representatives where he served uh, with distinction. Uh, at this most recent uh, insurance commissioner election, Glenn was elected by 62% of the vote, quite a mandate. Glenn, sure glad to have mm -hmm. you and thanks for joining us. Of course, thank you for having me, appreciate it. Yeah, so you've been on the job, what, uh, six months now? Full six months, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> got it all figured out. Tell us about the size of your office and, and the day-to-day -day operations of, of what you all do. Okay, yeah, so, so the insurance department, roughly about 125 employees uh, total. We have an Oklahoma City office where the vast majority of our, our folks are. And then we also have a Tulsa office uh, to try to service the Northeast uh, region here. We've got a couple of fraud officers there. We've got some outreach folks. And um, so that, that's the uh, extent of the office. But we've got quite a purview. Every state handles the insurance department, the commissioner's role differently. Hmm. Uh, so, it, But in our state, of course, we oversee insurance companies and agents and licensing and continuing education, all of that. But some things folks don't know about are some of the other areas that um, we interact with, like funeral homes, when they're doing pre-need and uh, trusts and that sort of thing. Uh, we oversee license and CE for uh, bail bondsmen in our state. Um, and then uh, we also oversee um, PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers, third-party administrators, a number of other areas that you might not hmm. typically think of under the insurance role. But Sounds like the legislature just finds a need and oh, just Throw it to the insurance commission. Lumps it in. Yeah, each state, you know, some states include uh, maybe banking and finance and with the commissioner's really? role. Or, wow. or a lot of southern states, I know the insurance commissioner is also the fire marshal, but uh, we, we don't have either of those here in our state. But each state handles it just a little bit differently. I know that one of the responsibilities of your office is to supervise the operation of companies that uh, in the insurance business that are licensed to do business in Oklahoma. And that's a pretty astronomical number of companies, as I recall. How many companies do you supervise? Well, we, um, 
you know, in our state we have over 1,700 uh, insurers. We call them foreign insurers. In other words, they're not domiciled in our state, but they do business in our state. Right. And so we've got 17, more than 1,700 of those. But we've got 77 uh, domestics, what we call them, and they are established in our state. And those are ones that we uh, directly oversee and, uh, and do financial exams on every five years. Uh, by statute, we, we do full-blown financial exams uh, on them. And, and I, I happen to believe that's one of, if not the most important role that the department does, uh, and that is making sure that that insurance company is financially solvent and solid in their reserves and other things so that the commitments that they've made to you and to other Oklahomans, uh, that when that time comes when you need them, uh, that they have the wherewithal to take care of that and um, take care of their obligations. I've noticed uh, occasionally, not often, thank goodness, but occasionally there are instances in which, as a result of your examination, companies have not done very well and have been deemed insolvent. Uh, and you have to, at that point, take a more active role, do you not? We do. Uh, you know, we have uh, the Oklahoma Receivership Office established for that as a separate nonprofit that. Uh, that I'm, I'm part of. And um, so, you know, there are different levels of stepping in, if you will. So when a company reaches a certain level, um, we, we require them to submit a plan to us. How are you going to turn around this, this thing? And, and eventually it ends up, if they don't take care of that, where we step in and take over, we fully mm -hmm. take over the company and liquidate assets and pay claims. And, but there's the guarantee fund in Oklahoma too, so that uh, that is what pays those claims. A lot of folks don't know that, that um, if a company does somehow go under, uh, really what happens is the other insurance companies in our state are assessed dollars that go into that fund so those claims uh, do get paid. In fact, I might <coughs> make one comment. We recently just had an insurance company come out of receivership. They were able to, we were able Good. to rehabilitate them, but that's the first time in the history of Oklahoma that that has happened. Really? Hmm. Yeah, that way they weren't liquidated, they actually came out yeah. of receivership. Well, how often does one have to be liquidated? I mean, does one go bankrupt? No, I mean, not very often. Yeah. I mean, we've got uh, in the, at, at, at the moment, but but some of these go back many, many years mm -hmm. because what, you've got to, um, uh, you know, pursue options of why did they go under? Was it a faulty audit? Was the CPA to blame? Was, you know, what other act was the board? Right. Or was someone embezzling money? So there's legal action that has to take place to try to recover as much mm -hmm. Uh, uh, funds as possible for them, and so those get tied up for years and years and years. What but, role, uh, if any, does the federal government play in, in overseeing insurance? They, they they don't, and that's a great question. Uh, there is a federal insurance office that's mm -hmm. been that's been established not so so long ago, but really the role of that is more international uh, uh, based. It the insurance has been and continues to be a state regulated uh, industry. Uh, as I mentioned, I think prior to coming on air, that we had we've got 56 insurance commissioners that are part of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. So uh, we work closely together in establishing uh, model laws and and uh, inter interacting uh, with with licensing and and some other and exams. We might do multi-state exams and that that type of thing. So uh, the the 50 states plus five U.S. territories plus D.C. make up the uh, NEIC. Well. Six months on the job, what can you tell us about the general state of health of the insurance business in Oklahoma? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think, I mean, I, I campaigned on trying to bring more choices for Oklahomans, mm -hmm. uh, specifically in the health insurance world. You know, when the Affordable Care Act came out, it was signed into law March 23rd of 2010, uh, we started out with six individual health insurance plans that Oklahomans had a choice for. That next year it went to four, that next year there were two, and then for a couple of years we just had one option. And so uh, this past year, we've had two health plans offering individual health insurance. Uh, I will be, be meeting next week when I'm out of state in a meeting with another company that will be coming on board that following year. So we'll have three options for some Oklahomans. They won't be statewide, that third option. But um, so that's been a big part, more choices. I'm a big believer in the free market and competition. I think that drives down costs, increases innovation um, and efficiency. And so um, that's been a big piece. And uh, I've been out. Um, Lots of opportunities to go speak as the new guy, I guess, nationally mm -hmm. with some of these things. And so I've taken advantage of that, not really in sales mode, trying to sell Oklahoma for companies to come and move here. And uh, we've been very successful with that as well. We've got uh, two insurance companies right now that have, are re-domesticating to the state of Oklahoma in my first six, six months. Mm -hmm. um, now, I will say, on the first six months of my job, I could have done without the weather. As could, could most yeah. of Oklahomans, you know, we, right. we had, uh, you know, in my first six months, we've had our, uh, 
you know, third most tornadoes in the history of our state and then our worst flooding probably in our history. And so uh, that um, was, we were kind of thrown right in the middle of that. Yeah, uh, well, we'll talk about the impact to the Oklahomans when that occurs. Is long term, is there an, an elevated uh, exposure to, to prices going up in the future or is that going to be absorbed nationally? Yeah, the, the, there is. Um, the, the, there's, a, there's a local effect on that, but it, it also does, it's a little bit of both. Um, I will tell you, this really was my first exposure firsthand to, to major flooding. Uh, at, at being in the insurance business for 35 years, I've had lots of great experiences with folks, you know, delivering a check to a church that's burned to the ground, you know, yeah. the pastor and, uh, you know, those, some of those kind of things. And, you know, when a tornado comes through, I mean, it's a terrible thing, but it's pretty, pretty focused typically. And 90% of the damage is insured, right? Everyone's got coverage and we come in and we clean it up. and. Um, and, you know, we had, unfortunately, a couple of deaths in our El Reno um, yeah. a tornado, but um, the recovery is typically more quicker and cleaner and that sort of thing. The flood is just a terrible, um, it's just a mess. And so mm -hmm. that process of cleanup, that process of financial recovery is a really long, slow, painful process. Mm -hmm. and, and again, my first experience that major flooding and, and the really unfortunate part of that is 90% of that damage is uninsured. I mean, you know, really I, because they're in a flood zone to begin with. Well, no, the, you know, I think, you know, p part of it is uh, folks kind of get lulled. You know, there's we, w when was the last time we had a major flood? I mean, I, right. I know um, Memorial Day, uh, I was out in a boat with our county sheriff and um, and a county commissioner and uh, and we're in a boat going down streets, you know, and we've got the GPS out, so making sure we're staying in the street. And, uh, you know, you're looking at uh, 200 homes mm -hmm. with, you know, four feet or more of water in them. But most of those float folks weren't in the floodplain, the 100-year floodplain. They were in the 500-year floodplain. And unfortunately, what happened in this situation, I think, for a lot of folks is they, the mapping had changed. So the bank told them, you, don't, you are not required to have flood insurance anymore in order to have a mortgage with us. What they heard was, I don't need flood insurance, and unfortunately, I mean, clearly many of them did. And so um, we're, we're, we're launching a uh, sort of flood awareness program. We're gonna try to give some time after this to let things settle, and, and but uh, making folk, sure folks are aware of exactly how flood insurance works, that it's not as expensive as you might have heard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you walk into a community like Weber's Falls, I, I was, came, went out to Weber's Falls when the day after they had opened the community back up. It had been evacuated completely for a week. And uh, I encountered a couple, the very first people I saw, I, I wanted to jump out of the car and this is a 70 year old couple in their retirement home. Uh, they've had, I don't know, seven, eight feet of water in their house for a week. And they have no flood insurance, their house is paid for. That's a really tough path ahead for them and yeah. uh, without flood insurance. So. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll get back to uh, what role the state can play going forward in all of these issues and more. We're visiting with Glenn Mulready. He's the state insurance commissioner for Oklahoma, and we'll be back after this. OU Law has a history and heritage that are unparalleled. At the University of Oklahoma College of Law, we empower our students to pursue the career of their dreams. We have the highest U.S. news ranking ever achieved by an Oklahoma law school. We are the first law school in the country to launch a college-wide digital initiative. And this year, our competition teams rank number two in the nation. OU Law, generations of excellence, limitless possibilities. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma, 
loyal to you. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Our guest is Insurance Commissioner Glenn Mulready. When we left, you were discussing a, an encounter you had with a couple in Weber's Falls who seemingly had lost everything. I think there's a perception that with, with FEMA or maybe the state government, but somebody comes in and makes everybody whole in a major disaster like Oklahoma experience. That's really not the case. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great point. Um, you know, the importance of flood insurance and what we found is that we just do not have a lot of uptake with, with flood insurance. And so without flood insurance, you do have help it, if it's declared, you know, if, if and, and we had 27 counties that were declared for uh, eligible for individual assistance, and that's what we're talking about. And, but the maximum amount is $35,000. The average amount in this disaster has been about $8,000 to uh, folks, so they're not gonna have coverage like they do flood insurance to take care of every uh, item at all. And uh, so, uh, you know, folks are thankful for FEMA, and it's federal help that comes in. Uh, and then also what comes in on the heels of that is small SBA comes in with some small business loans to help, but those, those have to be paid back, and they're mm -hmm. low interest loans, and you have to qualify for those, but it, it does not take the place of insurance. Let's uh, focus a little bit more on your department and uh, your activities are quite diverse. You have a, a good number of employees. Uh, do you get state appropriations uh, to fund your uh, department? We do not. We are we are what the state would call a non-appropriated agency, and that is we we totally operate within uh, the, the the fees and and uh, other uh, dollars that come into uh, through our agency. So you earn your own way. We right? we do, and and then substantially more. I mean, we we funnel over three hundred million dollars to the um, general revenue fund for the state. Uh, I don't think folks realize how big the insurance business is and the premiums that flow through. And I, I might mention too, uh, in our state, we have a premium tax. So every dollar of premium, there's a two and a quarter percent premium tax on that. 55% of those premium tax dollars go towards our um, public safety pensions. So a big part of the insurance world is what's helping fund our police and fire uh, pensions in our state. What do you, as commissioner now with the six months uh, tenure, what do you see as your biggest challenges? I, I think, you know, to my earlier point, trying to bring more, bring more choices to Oklahomans, again, yeah. specifically in the health insurance world, that has just been a real thorn in our side the last couple of years, uh, a post-affordable post uh, care act. So uh, I think that's big. Uh, fraud is an issue. It's always an issue. Um, you know, I, I jokingly, when campaigning, called it the high blood pressure of the insurance world. It's sort of the silent killer. I mean, every <laughs> premium you're paying, there's a piece of that that is due to the fraud that takes place. And in our state, we bifurcate our, our fraud. In other words, our consumer fraud is handled by our attorney general's office. Right. And um, license, what I would call licensee fraud is what we oversee and, and pursue, and that is agents and, and, and brokers, or uh, you know, you've heard bail bondsmen, funeral homes, folks that we license, fraud that might be taking place with that. And so, you know, every couple of years, you'll see a newspaper article uh, about an insurance agent who was collecting premiums from someone and wasn't mm -hmm. remitting those to the company, and uh, folks didn't have insurance. They didn't know they didn't, but uh, so those are the, the bad guys that we go after. So we've got uh, about seven, um, most of them are all retired uh, Oklahoma City or Tulsa PD, and uh, they're pursuing um, the insurance Investigators. Fraud. Yes, investigators that are are pursuing that fraud and then handing over cases to the Attorney General's office to prosecute. I would assume every legislative session there's bills introduced that affect the insurance industry. Does your office get involved in, in, in that side of it? We, we do. We, we have a, 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 a gentleman in our office who's our legislative liaison. He interacts with the legislature and so we will typically, when, when I say we, my office will have a slate of legislation and some of that is just uh, just updating or tweaking of certain statutes that we know something's come up. Others might be uh, sort of model acts. I talked about the NEIC, yeah. and so uh, there are certain um, ways of doing things, sort of best practices that as a national organization we might uh, endorse and, and get behind, and then we try to get that passed in our state as sort of best practices for insurance departments and insurance business and industry. As the, uh, we're kind of in between sessions now in the legislature, <clears throat> do you have anything in mind that you'd like to see enacted by the legislature that would yeah, help? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the top thing on my uh, list it was something I, I worked on this year, and I 
kind of got sick of beating my head against the wall, <laughs> but, but which is very frustrating. And that's the issue of surprise billing. And so the quick scenario is you go to a hospital for a, a procedure, it's in network, your surgeon is in network, and then suddenly you get a surprise bill after the fact from, it's typically an anesthesiologist, a radiologist, someone like that, that's not in network. So you're getting a sizable bill from someone who you didn't choose. You did not have a decision point. And uh, you know, if you choose to go out of network because you want to see a different doctor, you want to go to a different hospital, that's one thing. It's a conscious decision. When you don't, the, the consumer should be held harmless in that situation. And uh, that's what I'm trying to address. Uh, and we hopefully can get that done this year. We, it's tough balancing the providers, the physicians mm -hmm. and hospitals with the health plans and trying to find, uh, trying to split the baby, if you will, on that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we, we had a bill this year. We couldn't get that done, but hopefully we will next mm -hmm. year. There's a, an insurance company located in another state. Do they have to license themselves in every state for which they do business? Yes, yep, they do. They, 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 they will be, as we talked about earlier, they'll be um, domiciled in a certain state, and that's who's doing exams and really has the authority over them, but they do have to get licenses in each and every state. And, you know, across our country, uh, you know, certain states are, are um, more difficult to deal with maybe mm -hmm. from a business standpoint and so uh, some of them are slowed down and in, in certain places but uh, but we have a good relationship again through that NEIC um, connection mm -hmm. uh, with, with most other states and with uh, other other commissioners and it, regulators. It does seem like the consumer does benefit from competition in the insurance agency maybe as much as any industry I could name. It just seems like companies are, are fighting for their market share right. and if they can find a way to lower their premiums and deliver an, an effective policy to a, to a consumer they'll, they'll try and do it. Right. That's, that's the idea. That's my idea from a free market uh, competitive standpoint. That's what we want to have here. A vibrant free market insurance industry um, uh, competing against the other, competing for those dollars. Um, but also, our role is to ensure that those companies are doing that wisely. Uh, you know, it, it does you no good to have a really low premium, and then when you have a claim, that company's out of business. So that's yeah. our role, is to protect the consumers that way. I believe that's the number one uh, role of the insurance department, is to protect consumers. What role does your office have in the regulation, if any, of rates that insurance companies charge their uh, uh, policy holders. Well, e again, each state handles that a little bit differently. Our state is a, a, a what we call a typically a file and use state, uh, and so they're, they're going to file rates with us. We don't technically approve the rates. I mean, we, we review them, we make sure they're not discriminatory uh, and, and they're fair, that sort of thing, and, and that they're adequate, adequate, fair, not non discriminatory, that sort of thing. But uh, we don't have absolute authority over the rates that companies file. Again, kind of back to the free market situation, you know. And, and, the, the market will really decide what, what are uh, proper rates, right? I mean, if, if, if you have enough competition uh, and someone's setting the rates substantially too high, they hopefully won't be in business very long and won't be uh, maintaining those rates for very long. Yeah. We have a phone number we're going to put on the screen that uh, provides uh, consumers with some assistance. That number is 1-800-522-0071. What can callers expect if they dial that number? Glad you brought that up. We have a consumer assistance area that is uh, specifically delegated to take care of consumers. Uh, often it's an elevated level for a claim. Maybe they've got an auto insurance claim and they're frustrated <laughs> or something is, is happening there. So they call that number. We've got a number of folks there. Uh, they'll they'll uh, fill out what we call an RFA, request for assistance, and then we contact the insurance company. They've got a very specific time frame. They have to respond back to us. But we've been we handled almost 17,000 calls last year on that consumer assistance line. Wow. And uh, I can tell you that in the first six months of this year, my first six months, we just did a press release last week that we recovered $5.1 million for Oklahomans, which was almost double the whole amount we did all of last year. Mm -hmm. I want to say it was three and a half million that we did last year. We, we've done 5.1 in the first six months of this year. So a very effective unit standing by, ready to help folks. Great to have you on, and uh, please thank your staff for all the work they do for Oklahoma. I will. Thank yeah, you for having me. Indeed. I appreciate it. Insurance Commissioner Glenn Mulready, our guest today on The Verdict. Kent and I will have a final word when we get back. It used to be okay in hospitals. It used to be okay in movie theaters. It was okay in classrooms, restaurants, and airplanes. But thanks to a greater understanding of the dangers, that's not okay anymore. So now that we know secondhand smoke causes lifelong health problems, why is it still okay to smoke with children in the car?
bottom line, it's not okay. Let's get serious about protecting kids. Join the fight at stopswithme.com. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. I really think people are so unaware of the number of kids waiting just in Oklahoma. And I think if more people knew that those children were out there waiting, you know, I think that just by the way we live our lives and the people we talk to, that, that maybe we could help encourage adoption from Oklahoma. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're wrapping up a show with Insurance Commissioner Glenn Mulready. Yeah, Glenn really uh, does a good job. Uh, he was, because of his vast ins experience before he became Insurance Commissioner, he hit the ground running and a lot of good things has happened uh, thus far uh, under his supervision. And uh, as he mentioned, one of the worst uh, state floodings yeah. in, in well, history. And from a dollar amount, certainly the worst. It is terrible, but in a kind of a reverse sense, it's good that we had somebody in that position mm -hmm. so well experienced to uh, be able to deal with it as effectively as they did. We have some uh, web information for you. You can uh, get more information with Glenn's office at this website, ok.gov slash OID. That's ok.gov slash OID. And we have a website. We'd love for you to log on and tell us about a guest you'd like to see or an issue you'd like to see us discuss on a future edition of The Verdict. That website is theverdict.tv. We will see you next week. Mm -hmm.